This is a sound that hasn't been heard for 2,000 years. This is ancient Greek music, as we think it was actually sung around 400 BC. I'm an associate professor of classics at Oxford University, and for the last five years, I've been concentrating on reconstructing the sounds of ancient Greek music. We're rehearsing in Jesus College Chapel for a concert that we're going to be putting on later in the Ashmolean Museum. The singers in the choir are scholars of ancient music and they're going to be accompanied by replicas of original instruments that were used in ancient Greece. What we call Greek poetry is mainly words that were intended to be sung, very often with the accompaniment of instruments. So the Greek poetry of the ancient world, this was all sung to music. People think the music is lost. I don't believe it is. We have the rhythms we have the instruments and we have the melodies. Put that together and you have the music. Okay. Um. <laughs> and can we just say, tinumenai dikan, tinumenai ponu. So instead of, well, what we know most about are the rhythms because they're inscribed in the meter. The metrical systems of ancient Greece were very precise and they were based on the language. The Greeks conventionally thought that the words of their language consists of either long or short syllables. So we might say that a long syllable followed by two short ones would sound like da, 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 da. So you get a rhythm such as the dactylic hexameter, da, 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 da. And that is the rhythmical basis that we can use when we're reconstructing the sound of Homeric music. What we needed to do was to bring together the other elements, which were the melodic sound of ancient song. And the source material for the melodies is about 60 very precious ancient documents, which have been preserved on stone, such as the Delphic Paean by Athenaeus, which is one that we will be singing in the concert. And that has what we might call 80 or 90 bars of music, melodic, notation preserved that allows us to recreate and sing that piece. One of the most exciting things that has happened over the past decade is the discovery and recreation of replicas of instruments. So for example there's a aulos, which is a double pipe that is in the Louvre which is in such good condition that we can replicate it absolutely precisely and get wonderful pipers to play it. And that gives us an indication of the sound of the instrument and the tuning. The other is the stringed instruments. The kithara is the concert version of the lyre. We have some wonderful ancient vase depictions from which we have actually created replicas and one of which will be used by Stefan Hagel in the concert. And then it's a question of working out how the instrument was played. So this is an aulos or a double pipe and it's made of deer bone and the reeds are made of Mediterranean cane, grows everywhere like a weed uh, and it's a single tube which you delicately scrape and heat up and squeeze and clamp. It's quite wide bore compared with later double pipes. The other instrument uh, we play from maybe two or three centuries later is made of wood uh, and has a narrower bore. Uh, this one is a powerful instrument for outdoors accompanying 50 singers uh, in the temple um, or in a dance. So the tones that it produces, it's fascinating. They clearly didn't want a great big range because as you can see, they're similar length and they basically are one note apart. So you've got one going la da 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 and the other one going la da 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 and that means there's lots of overlap and you can play games with the dissonance uh, between the two pipes that you wouldn't be able to do if they were offset. 
these instruments give us a, a range. You know, you, you can't, it's basically um, an F sharp, a little bit below an F sharp, uh, at an octave. And that is, it, it lies beautifully with the other ancient evidence. So it really supports the, the reconstructions of the notations. So yes, when I accompany the Orestes chorus with this, we're able to play it at the same pitch it was written. It took a long time to figure out how to do that because the two lowest notes aren't available on a single pipe. So by switching the F sharp and the G between the two pipes, um, I can actually play the melody. So there we are, I'm sharing the la da, la da 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 dum. I can play the bottom note here, and I can play the next note there. But I don't have both of those notes on both pipes. <laughs> so it's got to be shared. One of the most important things I tried to convey in my conducting has been to channel and express the contrasting moods and contrasting emotional implications of what they are singing, which is very exciting because tonight we have a big performance coming up in the Ishmaeli Museum where we'll have not just academic colleagues who are very knowledgeable about what we are actually singing, but also BBC Radio 3 who are going to record our performance for the early music show. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this unique event. Essentially, we classicists study poetry. And all this poetry was composed with music. When Homer was composing the Iliad and the Odyssey, he composed with a four-stringed lyre. One can reconstruct four notes, which we think were probably the basis of Homeric music. This is the earliest music that we think we can reconstruct, the music of Homer from around 700 BC and Stefan Hagel is taking the four notes that are at the basis of ancient Homeric music and improvising based on the Homeric text. What Stefan has reproduced is a simple and fairly repetitive melody. You can hear the underlying metrical, rhythmical dactyl, the da, 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 da. And you hear the melody, and at the end of each line, a kind of instrumental flourish just on the strings of the kithra. The second piper is Callum Armstrong, who is uh, an expert on the Aulos and is going to demonstrate an improvisation on the instrument. We have some sense of the notated music that an Aulos would have played, but essentially an expert piper like Callum needs to try and produce whatever sounds he can on the instruments that we have. And so here he's improvising and showing the kind of sounds that the two pipes together can make. So you'll notice that the techniques that are used by the pipers is circular breathing, where they're breathing in normally through their nose, they're holding the breath in their cheeks and they're pushing it out. And at the same time, they are taking breaths into their nose so that they can make a continuous sound, a bit like bagpipes, but doing it with their own bodies.
most exciting development in reconstructing ancient music is reconstructing the melody. We do have documents with melodic notation, notation that was devised around the 5th century BC, including this wonderful stone from Delphi, which has a paean, which is a hymn of praise in honour of Apollo. And on the stone, we have the words of the text that was sung, and above the text, we have these little symbols, which is the vocal notation, which tells us the precise melodic notes to which those words were sung. Now, there are some gaps, and I have filled in those gaps using only the notes that are available to us from the rest of the stone. So the final piece is a chorus from Euripides' Orestes, in which the young Orestes is being chased by the furies of his mother, these spirits of vengeance. This is perhaps the most exciting piece of music that survives from antiquity. It's on a papyrus, about two inches square. There's Greek writing on it, which is the text of Euripides' Orestes, a chorus from that, a few lines of it. Above that writing, there are these symbols, which are the melodic notes to which that text was set. So the finale of this performance is the reconstructed version of the chorus from Euripides' Orestes.